So I'm a neuropathologist. That's a pretty rare and endangered, and endangered species in, uh, in uh, uh, clinical neurosciences. Probably, have you ever seen a neuropathologist alive? <laughs> or just Alzheimer on the pictures? So I'm one of those. But uh, it's really, actually, in the field of clinical neurosciences, it's a bit of a problem that there is a shortage of neuropathologists. So there is a great uh, demand for uh, morphological correlation of all sorts of diseases, and uh, I'm trying to do uh, my best. So I'm going to a little bit introduce what neuropathology is and what uh, the context to neurodegeneration is. Then I'm going to talk about the ALS and FTD, frontotemporal dementia brain, on macroscopy, and what we see under the microscope and uh, present you the current molecular classification of this disease, which is uh, not only for neuropathologists, but uh, sort of the role of neuropathology is also reflected that uh, the clinical classification of these diseases are based on the uh, neuropathological classification, uh, based on the, on the proteinopathy uh, uh, concept. And then I will highlight some of the pathogenic, uh, pathogenic implication, some clues from neuropathology, and uh, couple of uh, possibilities for future directions in research and also in diagnosis. So this is not an orphan Olympic uh, uh, symbol, but uh, may look like that. So neuropathology is really very closely related, and I made some effort to put this uh, circle in the right place. I think the greatest overlap we have is with uh, neurology. Quite a lot with neurosurgery, especially in diagnosing brain tumors, and psychiatry, especially in the field of dementia. With neurology, all sorts of diseases, it's not only the neurodegenerative field, but also obviously the stroke, multiple sclerosis, and then also sort of neurological diseases and muscle pathology that also belongs to the field of neuropathology. I do more than 200 muscle biopsies every year, obviously from the living patient, uh, from all sorts of conditions. So uh, neuropathology has a pretty interdisciplinary uh, collaborative network, and we sh shouldn't forget about, obviously, the pathology, imaging, and geriatrics, and more, more importantly, the basic neuroscience. I think among these specialties, we neuropathologists may have the biggest overlap with what you do as a basic uh, neuroscientist. And this is one of the fascinations, one of the big challenges for us to be up to date to the questions and, uh, and uh, level of knowledge and most recent developments uh, uh, with the uh, neuroscientist. And now I'm going to talk on subjects uh, related to neurodegeneration. The definition is we call a disease neurodegenerative. There is a progressive, slow, irreversible neuronal loss. There is some uncertainty sometimes, even in the literature, what we call neurodegeneration or neurodegenerative death. But I think this definition is, is worth uh, keeping in mind. There are two major groups with overlaps, dementias and movement disorders. And the example for today is ALS and frontotemporal dementias. But you have it in other type of diseases, the synucleinopathies, Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease dementia, or in tauopathies, corticobasal degeneration, progressive supranuclear palsy. It's very interesting that they are, there are sort of two sides of the coins and there is quite a lot of overlap. Some patients with movement disorder have dementia and vice versa. So this is one of the fascinations of the uh, neurodegeneration and there is uh, uh, still a lot of unknown why these, uh, uh, actually this is based on selective neuronal vulnerability. So why those neuronal populations are selectively uh, affected, which are implicated in memory and movement, and why those and why not others. So it is really uh, something interesting to, to, to bear in mind. And why is neuropathology important in uh, neurodegeneration? First of all, we provide and we are sort of the uh, uh, in charge of the brain tissue. First of all, diagnosis. This is our primary responsibility, but also for research. And we have brain banks all over the world to uh, store these brains. And whenever you submit a request with an ethical uh, uh, application, sort of et et ethical approval, then we do our best to provide you brain for research. Epidemiological data, we are also sort of monitoring the clinical diagnosis. You should never forget that apart from very rare genetically uh, determined cases for neurodegenerative diseases, the only definite diagnosis can be achieved by neuropathology. Uh, for example, for Alzheimer's disease being the most frequent in the, one of the best centers like the Institute of Psychiatry, King's College London, where I, I've been working for several years, 80% concordance between clinical and neuropathological diagnosis. And that is probably more or less the best what you can get. So it is really very important to, to assure and verify and, uh, and uh, detect the diagnosis, especially if there is a clinical trial or pharmacol uh, pharmacological treatment going on. Uh, one of the reasons for the failure that uh, actually those 
say 20% of those patients didn't even have Alzheimer's disease who received the Alzheimer's drug. Teaching and training, genetic factors or familial diseases, it's important. I don't want to go in details, you know better than me. Uh, clinical and biomarker trials, as, 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 as uh, mentioned before, it's very important to know what really is going on in the brain, especially because there are so many coexisting pathologies. It is so rare to have, say, only Alzheimer's disease and nothing else. That's an extremely rare example, one in 10 or less. Usually there are coexisting proteinopathies or vascular conditions or other sorts of diseases. And the prion disease always comes into the picture. It can mimic so many conditions, and it has a very important surveillance function for us neuropathologists to exclude prion diseases. Say, not all cases, but uh, because sometimes it's obviously uh, not in the question, but uh, there are surprises quite often that there is a prion disease, what was thought earlier to be uh, uh, Alzheimer, for example. And uh, I'm not going to go through this table. Just to show you what we call minimal clinical data are very, very numerous. And if someone is... Uh, is having a brain bank or wants to do clinical pathological type of uh, research on brain tissue, it's important to have the supportive clinical data. Without that, it is uh, rather limited of use and you can never publish in the papers you, you I'm sure, uh, regularly publish in. And, uh, for example, genetics, some biochemistry in selected cases is extremely important and, uh, and these tasks are done usually for us by, by uh, researchers. And uh, you see all the other necessary uh, factors. Agonal stays, post-mortem delays, so many of the tissue factors which are really important. And uh, now I'm going to start to talk about the topic itself, motor neuron disease or ALS. I'm going to explain why they are not absolutely identical. So it's called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It's uh, more than 100 years old. The uh, uh, name of the disease and still holds at least, uh, so it is uh, still valid. So there is amyotrophy means muscle atrophy due to anterior horn cell loss and motor unit denervation. So that is the most uh, prevalent uh, clinical feature. And this is usually why the patient dies because the respiratory muscles are also going to be affected. The patient cannot uh, actually ventilate and then that is going to be uh, leading to death not by suffocation, but usually there comes a bronchopneumonia. That's the most frequent cause of death in disease patient. And there we have the lateral sclerosis. Sclerosis means hardening and lateral. We have to uh, think about the lateral column of the spinal cord, where the corticospinal tracts are running down to the motor neurons. Those are uh, severely affected. And uh, what was observed 100 years ago or more, that they are a little bit harder, because they are, they are gliotic. So hence the name of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis progressive disease and it is not uniform. We learn more and more how heterogeneous uh, ALS is, which uh, makes it more interesting, but obviously it makes it much more difficult to understand. And, uh, and uh, regarding the nomenclature, I think it's important to, to know that ALS is just one of the motor neuron syndromes. So that's an umbrella term that motor neuron disease or motor neuron syndrome because uh, not only ALS is motor neuron disease. So there are some diseases like hereditary spastic paraparesis, which are affecting only the uh, upper motor neurons, never the lower. And there are some spinal bulbar muscular atrophy, spinal muscular atrophy, which are selectively attacking the lower motor neurons. And there, here you have the ALS with the primary lateral sclerosis and uh, uh, a primary, <laughs> primary muscular uh, atrophy which, uh, which has both lower and upper motor neuron involvement but a uh, little bit of predilection for the uh, one or the other. But the majority of the motor neuron diseases are truly ALS where you have both upper and lower motor neuron involvement but don't use motor neuron disease and ALS as a synonym because uh, motor neuron disease or motor neuron syndrome is a much more wider umbrella, uh, umbrella term for uh, uh, several other diseases. ALS is a difficult problem, so nobody is making notes because it is so obvious, we know that, and, uh, and, and, uh, and why it is. So it is still relatively uncommon, although it is not so extremely uncommon as it is uh, appreciated by even medics, because unfortunately these people die uh, within two years, and most of those time they are spending somewhere uh, not in the public space. Uh, so ALS is not much less common than, uh, than multiple sclerosis, but multiple sclerosis patients, fortunately, they may live up to 20 years from the, uh, disease onset, and they are around us. But ALS people die, unfortunately, very early, Mo mostly sporadic. There is a sudden onset, uh, onset. It may affect any ages. It is rapidly progressive, usually, and there is a big heterogeneity, both in the clinical phenotype. 
and in the genetic phenotype. The early diagnosis of motor neuron disease could be very difficult because it may mimic se several other diseases as well. And uh, genetics is important because uh, genetics uh, may give us clues to the pathogenesis. So it's really interesting. So uh, in the past uh, 10 years or so, all those uh, new uh, discoveries in genetics uh, in, uh, in the ALS field have uh, opened so many new avenues for research because each and every mutation uh, highlighted some aspects of the disease, which, and many of them have never even been uh, thought about that. And actually, we are in familial ALS, we are uh, covering the field, the, the map, more and more. So this was in, in 2013, and now the, the pie chart is even more filled. Only these cases are unknown. But since the discovery of C9, and then a couple of years earlier, the TDP and the FUS, actually most of these cases have already been uh, discovered. So 10 years ago, only the SOD1 was known. But now it, uh, it's more or less covered. So we have it now approximately here. And uh, my geneticist colleagues say that a couple of more years and this is going to be done. And then a few more generations to work on why and how things are happening. And obviously, these have an effect also on the, on the background of sporadic diseases because uh, uh, they may also uh, affect uh, some uh, sporadic conditions as well. The microscopy of ALS. If you talk ALS, we think about the spinal cord primarily. It is actually not so easy to spot what the difference is for someone who is not doing it regularly. So this is the normal spinal cord. And here we have the spinal cord from a motor neuron disease patient, very advanced. And here you see the differences. The, the anterior nerve roots are really very thin as compared to this one, whereas the posterior nerve roots are more or less look the same as, uh, as in the normal condition. Uh, look, it's also very, very thin in the anterior. This is the uh, first, uh, uh, first uh, thoracic one. And, uh, and there is also some brownish grayish discoloration. It is related also to the gliosis, an absolutely non-specific finding. But uh, the thin anterior nerve roots is obviously the clue for the diagnosis. If you look at the brain, and this is maybe a surprise, if you look at the brain, in the majority of ALS cases, we don't see anything. Really, so we don't see the very severe atrophy of the precentral gyrus. There may be motor neuron loss under the microscope, but uh, you don't see very severe atrophy. So uh, the rule is that uh, the brain in motor neuron disease does not really show uh, striking abnormalities, if it is more or less a pure motor neuron disease. However, it is, if it is associated with cognitive problems and frontotemporal dementia, then uh, you may see some frontotemporal atrophy. In this case, it is not so severe, and I wanted to show a brain where you really have to look for that. Here in the anterior lobe, there is some widening of the gyri. Here, indeed, you see the uh, precentral gyrus being uh, narrower than normal, and the anterior third of the temporal lobe is also a little bit atrophic, but it's still not extremely striking, usually in these cases. And uh, what is... Uh, uh, what, do, uh, what do we see under the microscope? So this is uh, what, uh, uh, what, what is available, what has been available for more than 100 years, the special stains. This is the myelin stain, luxolfase blue. And if you stain uh, with this one, the normal uh, density of the myelin is this one. This is the posterior uh, columns. And what you see here, that this is the corticospinal tract in the lateral, and here is in the anterior part of the medulla oblongata, you see the uh, olivary uh, nucleus uh, on both sides, and the pyramidal tract is uh, severely demyelinated. It is not a primary demyelinative process. What is happening? The axons die, and as the axons die, the myelin has no more use or actually uh, no functional importance anyway, and they are going to be eaten up mainly by macrophages. So if we would do macrophage stain, uh, CD68, for example, then would be uh, large numbers of macrophages eating up the myelin. And there is some astrocytic gliosis, and this gives this hardened, hardened appearance also on macroscopy and on palpation to the spinal cord. There is uh, reduced numbers of, uh, of motor neurons here in the anterior horn. Some of them... Uh, are uh, degenerative, so shrunken and small, and uh, you see some, some, some aggregates there. It's very difficult to spot, but uh, you may see that. And obviously the peripheral nerve is important because if, uh, if you would examine a, a peripheral nerve, which is a motor nerve, then you see severe neuronal loss. In the clinical practice, we do not do that because we are not removing motor, uh, motor nerves. So this is uh, in the post-mortem uh, diagnosis what we use. 
And uh, this is what I mentioned, that uh, if you look hard if, and if you have good imagination and uh, you have some little bit of uh, background knowledge and, uh, can you make an, and you can make an educated guess, then you may say that uh, the problem is because of those funny things in the cytoplasm. Yeah? So this was drawn 150 years ago by, uh, by Charcot, who was a neurologist. And, uh, and he postulated that time that uh, ALS is a disease of abnormal proteins. So at that time, it was a statement absolutely out of the blue. He, it was a postulate. Obviously, he could not prove that. But what we have done over the past 150 years was actually confirming that he was absolutely right. So in uh, neurology or even in neuropathology, he is like Totti in football in Italy. So better, I can say. So he's an absolutely uh, cracker, one of the greatest neuroscientists uh, ever lived. And, uh, uh, Charcot, a French person. It's worth uh, uh, memorizing his name because he was uh, absolutely a genius and not only for ALS but also for research in general. And indeed, uh, on the path of uh, uh, Charcot's suggestion, uh, neuropathologists were looking on nerve cells and, uh, and, and uh, trying to find some abnormal things. So the way we work neuropathologists, that obviously we have learned neuroanatomy at school, and uh, we are just looking for something which is not the normal, yeah? And trying to figure out what the abnormal is. And uh, this is what, uh, what is also possible with this very basic stain, hematoxylin and eosin. Hematoxylin is blue in the nuclei, and eosin stains red the cytoplasm. And we see all sorts of structures, which, uh, which uh, have been named usually after the person who discovered them first. Some, uh, uh, yeah, usually cytoplasmic. Pig bodies, cortical Lewy bodies. Some of them are nuclear, are Marinesco bodies. The odd Lewy body in the substantia nigra, that's why the brown pigment. Intranuclear inclusion body. These are the typical neurofilament inclusions in, uh, in, uh, in Alzheimer's disease, the tangles. Granulovacular degeneration, that's a uh, little bit uh, a different thing. We have the amyloid plaques, dystrophic neurites amyloid plaque and the torpedo. So all these structures have been described over the uh, decades, and then, uh, then the idea was probably they are very important in disease, but it was not known what these proteins are. And uh, all this uh, led to the concept of the so-called proteinopathy cascade. So it cannot be put in, uh, in, in, a, in a picture format uh, more simple than this, that there is a normal protein. This is important. All these diseases start with normal protein. So it's not something uh, which is being generated uh, just for the sake of the disease. But some normal protein is going to go wrong. Yeah? So this is the basic con concept of human disease. There is a process which is normally important, which goes wrong, and is, as a vicious cir circle, going to be self-destructive. The same thing is happening in cancer, and I'm sure in most of the diseases. So rarely mutation or environmental changes, and the environment obviously has to be put in the broader context, not only the bad weather, but the microenvironment of the cell is resulting in a misfolded protein which is prone to aggregation. It may deposit, and these deposits are somehow killing the cell. So this is obviously uh, plays an important role, but uh, the real picture, as you know, uh, very well is, is much more complicated but, uh, than this, but I think it's important to see something on the simplest way to be able to understand the whole complexity later on. If you don't know the basics, then, uh, then you are going to be lost uh, with the specific details, I'm sure. And indeed, I'm just referring back to those pictures with all these funny uh, bodies and cytoplasmic structures. Uh, we understand that the, in different uh, uh, cytoplasmic or nuclear inclusions are leading to the neurodegeneration, and these abnormal protein aggregates are very important in disease pathogenesis. And based on this, uh, I'm, I'm showing this, uh, this slide from the last decade, because that is how that was understood not that long time ago, uh, that uh, these, uh, these uh, neurodegenerative diseases can be classified as proteinopathies. And these inclusions could be intraneuronal or extracellular. The extracellular was the prion protein and the beta amyloid. If it is intraneuronal, now we know that uh, they are tend to be quite frequent also in glial cells. Uh, Either they are intranuclear, but more frequently they, they, they are cytoplasmic. And uh, the three major cytoplasmic proteins were designated as alpha-synuclein tau and, in quotation mark, ubiquitin disorder, because that time it was not known what is the ubiquitinated protein in ALS and uh, frontotemporal dementia. Even the nomenclature was a bit different that time. And uh, now we know that the major ubiquitinated protein is the TDP43, and in neurodegeneration, these are the big four the big four proteins, the tau, 
the beta amyloid, which is extracellular, the alpha cyanuclein, and the TDP43. And we have the other two, the prion protein and the FUS, used in sarcoma, which make up the six basic proteins in neurodegeneration. Fortunately, they are not that numerous, so uh, we can work with them. But later I'm going to show the, the complexity what these six proteins can make uh, if we want to uh, specify them for, uh, for the uh, disease. But back to the point. So the first protein which was discovered uh, was ubiquitin in ALS. And, uh, and uh, it was a big struggle to find that. So a uh, little bit of medical history. It was in the 80s when uh, immunohistochemistry, which is considered now an old technique, uh, has, uh, was something extremely new to identify protein. So since the advent of immunohistochemistry and the techniques, uh, we were looking, or not me, but uh, my predecessors were looking for abnormal proteins. And in ALS, they have been looking for so many. But uh, this all was, success, uh, was unsuccessful. And Nigel Lee, who was a neurology professor at King's College London, his father discovered the Lee disease, another condition, a neurological condition. So he was destined to be a famous neurologist by uh, the family trace anyway, and he has uh, been true to the tradition. So he, was a very, he is still alive. He's a very uh, famous neurologist, and he was the first who described at the, uh, insti in the Institute of uh, Psychiatric King's College London that ubiquitin is an uh, abnormal protein in inclusions, and he, and he visualized these inclusions. And I can tell you the story that he told me that, you know, I was looking for so many things, he said. And then finally, you know, I looked up what other proteins are existing on the world. And he spotted this name, ubiquitin. He said, we must try this. This must be ubiquitous. So if ubiquitin is not there, then nothing is there. And he indeed found the ubiquitin. So ubiquitin was there. And then uh, uh, when we understand the function of ubiquitin, I don't want to go into that, and that this is flagging up abnormal proteins and trying to bring them to the UPS, the proteasome system. Uh, uh, the search started for the ubiquitinated protein, so which is the abnormal protein which is really causing the disease and flagged up by ubiquitin in these conditions. Just in brackets, that uh, later on, another protein, the P62 or sequestrosome 1, was also uh, discovered, which is part of the UPS machinery. And uh, we neuropathologists like to use P62 because it gives a much cleaner picture. Because ubiquitin is really ubiquitous. It's not only in the inclusions, but in the uh, axonal bulbs. It shows a very dirty background of the histological slide. But the P62 is supposed to be there only in the inclusions and where the UPS is operating. So P62 is also important. And P62 has, is becoming more and more fashionable because uh, as I'm going to get to that uh, later during my talk in the C9 or 72 ALS, the P62 is a very, very typical uh, protein in those inclusions, much more frequent than the TDP43. And it's actually at the, at the uh, P62 is implicated actually both in the uh, autophagy and the UPS pathway. So it is really important. It, it, it is an uh, important location in the uh, protein uh, degrading machinery in the cell. Well, it took another six years, five years, since the discovery of ubiquitin. And this was the first mutation, as you know, discovered in motor neuron disease, the SOD1 mutation in, uh, in 1993. And this can be detected by immunohistochemistry. Honestly, we don't use SOD1 immunohistochemistry anymore because genetics is much more reliable. And these cases are uh, almost always are already uh, done genetically by, uh, uh, in, in the living patient. So the question was, what is the major ubiquitinated protein in ALS and uh, the so-called ubiquitin variant of frontotemporal lobe de de degeneration? And you know the major discovery, perhaps the discovery of the decade in, uh, in, in the last decade in neurodegeneration, the TDP43. So TDP43 was really important. Neumann and, uh, and uh, there was a Japanese group who uh, probably parallel with them discovered this finding. And uh, this is from the science paper from Manuela Neumann. If you haven't read it, then do it, please. Because uh, this is a very nicely designed study and a very important uh, finding. And these TDP43 uh, species have been uh, uh, found in uh, ALS and motor neuron disease 
with the 45 kilodalton, 25 kilodalton species, and then uh, the uh, upper smear of ubiquitinated uh, proteins of different molecular weight. And uh, TDP43 immunohistochemistry did highlight these inclusions, which were actually identical to those which previously were marked with ubiquitin, and they co-localized. Later on, it turned out that actually the SOD1 mutant variant of ALS, the most frequent familial type that time, was actually negative with TDP43. It was a big blow because most of the uh, uh, preclinical trials and the ALS research was done on the SOD1 mice, which turned out to be not absolutely representative for the majority of motoneuron disease. So that was an important finding later on. And uh, actually, this research uh, result also implicated that uh, ALS and FTLDU, or now we call it FTLD TDP, are very much related to each other. Are they perhaps uh, the same disease with different symptoms and symptom onset? And I alluded to this topic earlier on, so there is no definite answer to that. There are quite a few arguments against the, for, for the different type of these two diseases. So I wouldn't say they are the same disease with a different phenotype because uh, there are quite many data saying that ALS and FTD could be uh, different in the molecular pathways. Uh, so these are just images, but I'd like to emphasize that the disease is not only the disease of the patient, but also disease of the... So it is also affecting the carer, the husband, the offsprings. So these neurodegenerative diseases have huge impact as... Uh, so not many diseases do have such a big impact on the family and the society. And these days we like to translate everything into money. So obviously it has huge financial implications. And uh, this is perhaps something which is helping uh, uh, the funding for discovering the, the uh, cure for these diseases. So after this, the TDP43 proteinopathies have been drafted as quickly as possible, but obviously as it happens, later on it turned out, uh, turned out to be not as simple as, uh, as it was thought earlier. Because, as said, the SOD1, uh, SOD1 ALS was negative, so that was not a TDP43 proteinopathy. ALS had a TDP43 negative uh, uh, form, which later turned out to be the FUS positive uh, ALS uh, FUS. The same happened with the FTIDU, and, and interestingly, a number of diseases have shown up some degree of TDP43 pathology, Alzheimer, dementia with Lewy bodies, even the muscle disease, inclusion body myositis. So, as it happens, as the research goes on, the discovery which at the beginning showed, uh, appeared to solve all the problems of the, in the field turned out to be cause confusion, but a much higher level. And uh, this was it, and then the question came, it was the title of a paper, it's not my, uh, uh, my uh, nice uh, sentence, that is, does it have at all a pathophysiological role, is it, or is it just there? And uh, the proof for that was the detection of uh, mutation causing motoneuron disease, TDP43 mutation causing motoneuron disease, which was uh, discovered by uh, the group I worked with uh, by Professor Chris Shaw in London, who uh, found sporadic and familiar cases with TDP43 mutation. And obviously the number of mutations grew, and uh, interestingly, usually uh, many of them are located in the glycine-rich uh, region of the, of the uh, molecule. Hope? Yeah. And what do we see under the microscope if we do TDP43 uh, immunohistochemistry? We, saw, we, we show these uh, TDP43 positive aggregates. Some of them are skein like We do see them also in the microglia, but I like this picture, this neuron. Actually, the other important uh, factor that the TDP43 is not in the nucleus, because in normal cells, you see the TDP43 in the nucleus, but this is mislocalized. I like this picture because it shows the TDP43 in a diffuse manner, not only in the inclusions. And uh, it's really in interesting also because, for example, in tauopathies, in Alzheimer, we call this, uh, st uh, this uh, state of the disease, morphological state of the disease, pre-tangle formation. When these abnormal tau proteins or the TDP43 pro uh, uh, proteins are more dispersed in the cytoplasm, and this is probably the preceding step to forming this. And now we know that many of these TDP43 molecules are in stress granules, which is also uh, a very important aspect of, uh, of ALS pathogenesis. Good, and if you do consecutive sections, you can show that the ubiquitin, the PP5062, and the TDP43 is co-localizing in the same neurons. 
not anymore a big novelty anymore. And that said, the mislocaliz uh, mislocalization into the, into the, uh, into the uh, cytoplasm is important. And uh, this uh, pair of pictures shows actually what uh, uh, the development in the antibodies, which um, is a long story but uh, useful, that this is the initial antibody, which shows all the TDP43, both the normal and the abnormal. And then you really have to hunt for the pathological pro, uh, cells which have the inclusions in the cytoplasm. But uh, later on, phospho-specific, disease-specific uh, TDP43 antibodies which were, uh, were developed, which are highlighting only the pathology. So it, uh, for lazy neuropathologists, this is the way to look at. It's very good. But actually, I like to have the phospho-TDP, because uh, the non-phospho-TDP, because it shows you the whole story of it. And I think it's an important lesson that, uh, say, it's approximately 3-4% of the cells which have the pathology, so it is not all the cells, just a minority. And when I showed this picture to some of my cell biologist colleagues who are working with uh, transfected cells and so on, cell, uh, and so on said, it's most amazing, this is very rare. So this is a snapshot uh, of time, obviously, when the patient died, showing that uh, these cells are in the process of the neurodegeneration with the cytoplasmic uh, TDP43 formation which is really a minority. You really, really have to hunt for those cells. In this uh, uh, population, it is more. And then this sort of finding uh, gave us the idea to explore more the nuclear import and the uh, uh, abnormality, possible abnormality of the uh, TDP43 import and export from the nucleus. And with uh, Boris Rogay, he is next door in Ljubljana in these days, but we uh, used to work, uh, work together in, in London for many, many years, and he is a very good colleague and friend of mine. Uh, we looked at dozens and dozens and dozens of proteins which were implicated in nuclear transport and which were potentially binding to TDP43. And indeed, we did, did identify the uh, abnormalities, uh, especially with the uh, karyoferins, karyoferin beta in uh, normal and, uh, and uh, disease cases. And there was also different between the ALS and the FTLD. Uh, so it was an interesting, and there is much research has been done uh, since in this topic Actually, last week or two weeks ago, a nice uh, review paper was published on this nuclear transport problems in the ALS. I think it's an interesting topic, but uh, I can't go in more details. I'm going to uh, say you a bit about the C9 FTD ALS from the neuropathological aspect. I know that you know er much more probably than me about the genetics of it, but uh, let's show how it started from the neuropathological point of view, because it has sort of a history. Back in 2008, the C9 orf was discovered in 2011, so September. So in 2008, there appeared some papers, and a little bit later by Andrew King from our group from King's College London and our joint paper later on before the publication of the mutation, that there were some strange cases with a cerebellar pathology in the Parkinger cell, some P62 positive inclusions, but they were absolutely descriptive papers. For example, this paper, we uh, sent in in 2010 for several journals. Nobody wanted to accept it. They said, well, it's, it's descriptive. You know, you can find interesting things in so many diseases. Tell me a mutation. Tell me a mechanism. And then we are going to publish it. And uh, as soon as the mutation was uh, 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 published, we did the mutation analysis in these cases. And this turned out to be the C9 or 72 uh, mutated uh, uh, ALS cases. So, Neuropathologists discovered this finding, but just did not know what that was at uh, that time. And, uh, and, uh, and the geneticists helped us to uh, solve the riddle. And uh, how the genetics started, actually Caroline once, again from uh, Chris Shaw Group, uh, King's College London, when she was a PhD student, he discovered the linkage to chromosome 9, which later on was uh, the area of the gene which, uh, which uh, has the C9 or 72 mutation. But my attention was drawn to this fact. It's not me who is reading all the uh, papers from all sorts of papers. Uh, so, but actually, there was a, a Scandinavian study in 1991 which described the family, a familiar form of uh, ALS with frontotemporal dementia. And after the discovery of the mutation 2011, and they went back and they identified that that was actually the first report on the uh, a genetic kindred, uh, kindred of uh, C9 or 72 mutation. A little bit similar story as with uh, neuropathology. So uh, clinicians observed the pattern, they described it, and it is worth doing that. Even if you see something, an observational finding, 
it's worth publishing then, because perhaps a couple of years later that is going to be the first report of something great. And uh, I'm going to go through quickly this uh, uh, slide. It just shows how the uh, mutation was uh, found uh, in the, in the uh, chromosome 9, which uh, and the region was narrowed down and down and down. And in the end, there was only three genes left, which were candidates. And I remember my colleagues at King's College London geneticists were really working day and night. They wanted to be the first after having discovered the FUS and the TDP. But uh, they couldn't get the uh, C9 or first. It was uh, published by uh, two American groups uh, back uh, so at the same time in uh, September uh, 2011, the expanded hexanucleotide repeat of the non-coding region of the C9 or 72 gene. And after that, we initiated a neuropathological study, a large-scale neuropathological study on, uh, with cases with repeat expansion, without, and control cases with no repeat. And uh, we did the thorough analysis, what we, the detailed analysis on, uh, on the cases, uh, not only on the sporadic ones, what we reported earlier, but uh, it was a large-scale study. And we did find and did confirm that all cases with the mutation have these very characteristic uh, uh, inclusions, which are positive with TDP43, but have peculiar localization in the cerebellum. You know, the cerebellum was used as a control tissue for our neurodegenerative studies earlier. We, we said there is no neurodegeneration in these diseases there. We used the cerebellum as a sort of uh, control sample to see tissue integrity of those diseases. So uh, it's, uh, it, it, it was a, a great surprise that we did find any neuropathology in these neurodegenerative diseases there. And uh, they were mainly P62 positive. There was really paucity of TDP43 positive inclusion. So that was actually the first clue to these cases, that there were hardly any TDP43 positivity and a lot of P62. And then uh, very, very few co-localizing cells. And we did find it in also in, uh, in, uh, in cases with frontotemporal dementia. And uh, so this is the C9 FTDAL, as, as we call them now. It's now textbook knowledge, and we published that not the neuropathological, actually back to back. And uh, this was a big rush, I remember, <laughs> it was part of it, because I think it was sort of an achievement that we published this paper at the same time uh, with the group who described the mutation, who obviously had some advantage with time to uh, characterize those cases. Yeah, we worked day and night on that, but uh, it was a successful enterprise. And, uh, and uh, regarding the clinical phenotypes, it is highly variable. Uh, the, the, the phenotype, it may be associated also with some other uh, neurological symptoms. And even within the same family of C9 ORF mutation, some, of, some have ALS, the others uh, FTLD, the other, some others both. So it is really, uh, there is a lot to learn about it, how uh, the uh, mutation is causing the disease and, how it and why it is manifest as it does. And some studies uh, suggest genetic anticipation, so related to the, uh, uh, so in, in subsequent generation, it uh, comes earlier and earlier with longer and longer repeats. And what is the protein composition of the aggregate? So that was the next question. I tried to make it short. Ubiquilin was first uh, described, which was uh, really interesting. Later on, it has been shown that mutation of ubiquilin is also causing ALS. And it had also a quite peculiar pattern. So not only the P62, but the ubiquitin immunohistochemistry with these peculiar inclusions can, uh, can actually tell us that this case must be a C9 FTD or ALS case. And uh, the big story was, as you know, the dipeptid repeat proteins in the inclusions published uh, parallel uh, from the Munich and the Mayo Clinic uh, uh, group and the RUN translation is uh, the mechanism which, uh, which is uh, implicated in the formation of these uh, repeats, GA, GP, GR. And uh, they, are, they do very nicely co-localize with, uh, with the inclusions. I have to go to the next slide. And just very briefly, that it, uh, it has some, some implications. This is a very, so it's an impressed paper in brain research. Uh, uh, so the, the, the translational, Part of this would be to understand more a little bit about the regulation of the run translation, how it can be interacted with, with some molecules, obviously not this one, uh, uh, to inhibit this process and to block uh, run translation, which could have a, a therapeutic effect, and uh, to develop PET ligands to detect each uh, dipeptid repeats, which would make it possible to detect uh, these in patients, perhaps before the onset of the disease. So this is what's going on. 
The second important aspect are the RNA foci and their toxicity. There are several papers. I'm showing the one with the uh, Chris Shaw group by uh, Yon Bok Lee, which has shown that uh, the number of uh, repeats is uh, corresponding to the size and the density of the uh, RNA foci, and uh, they are also very numerous in the, in the cerebellum, but also in the uh, hippocampus where these dipeptide repeats keep uh, occurring. And if we simplify and take it together, uh, there are uh, three implicated uh, mechanism. Again, it's an on press, in, in press paper in C9 or uh, mediated uh, neurodegeneration. So the uh, RNA toxicity, dipeptide repeats, I mentioned that. And the other possibility uh, is uh, that the abnormal, so the, the uh, mutation, which is a regulatory part of the of the gene is uh, affecting the uh, production and transcription of the protein, and this haploinsufficiency may also contribute to the disease pathogenesis. I think this is the area where we understand the least uh, uh, about uh, and, uh, and uh, need more research, but uh, for sure it is very complicated. Obviously, I, I'm just picking some aspects of the disease pathogenesis. This is uh, Mike uh, Strong's uh, from London, Ontario, Canada, favorite that the coaggregation of RNA binding protein is a common theme and so important in uh, C9 ALS. And uh, you, you do see many proteins. And uh, you know, I just deleted in the morning the slides about the HNRMP3, uh, RMD45. So there is a good number of uh, RNA binding uh, proteins there, and that this implicates an uh, important aspect of the disease. Yeah, and then uh, the ALS6 story. I'm going, I'm going to say this one, and then uh, probably I will have to finish a bit earlier than I wanted, but, uh, but uh, uh, there we are. So the ALS6 story, this is the discovery of the ALS FUS. Uh, this was uh, in, in 2006 when the uh, TDP mutation was discovered. Obviously, not only the group in London, but many other groups were searching for other candidate genes. And uh, uh, we and probably others were looking on functional and structural homology for candidate genes. And uh, one of our candidates was diffused in sarcoma. And making this story short, indeed, it has similarities with the TDP43 uh, function highlighted in blue. And uh, we did find the mutation of the fused in sarcoma, which was the next uh, major genetic discovery of, uh, of uh, ALS, uh, ALS uh, genetic background. Uh, we found three mutations, but after that, long uh, list of other mutations have arrived, uh, have been discovered. The nuclear localizing signal where our mutations were, were located uh, were indeed a very important domain, implicating that nuclear transport must play an important role only in the FUS. And the uh, immunohistochemistry and the neuropathology looked very similar. In the mutated cases, we did see inclusions of various uh, shapes and sizes. Again, my favorite is diffuse cytoplasmic stains, uh, staining, or the pre-tangle, or the pre-aggregate, uh, uh, or the pre-inclusion form was also present. And we did not find in controls and sporadic ones. And they were pretty rare to find. Many of these patients were relatively young, very uh, uh, rapid onset and uh, progression of the disease. So clinically, it was also very interesting. And, uh, and uh, late, you know, this was the early antibodies. It was very difficult to get a good antibody. So that's why in the original paper, it may not look as bright and nice as later on when obviously the industry has uh, put emphasis on generating better antibodies as well. And then later on, you could really very clearly see uh, these inclusions. Also in the glial cells. So the glial pathology is also very important. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, it was also discovered that the stress granules, not only in the DDP43 proteinopathies, but here also play a very important role in, uh, in, uh, in the formation. But there are big differences between ALS FAS and ALS TDP43. And I can't go into the detail, but, uh, but it's again, so there are probably more similarities than differences, but the ALS FUS uh, does show some distinct differences and the stress granule formation and how the uh, mutant FUS is, uh, is uh, sequestering the wild type FUS in the stress granules is quite uh, unique for the FUS proteinopathies and the ALS FUS. Uh, Caroline Wands is working uh, a lot on this. And as next step, as it happened with the TDP43, the FUS was also discovered in the, in the frontotemporal dementia, which uh, earlier was called uh, atypical frontotemporal degeneration with ubiquitin. But now we call them FTLD FUS. 
because we know what the abnormal protein is. It was uh, Manuel and Naiman's uh, group who discovered it. So the abnormal protein is not always the TDP43. They do show many similarities. And uh, we learn more about the function, and probably both the loss of function and the toxicity is important. And a little bit how we diagnose these cases. This is the diagnostic algorithm. So if we have a case uh, of ALS, we do the TDP43 immunohistochemistry. If it is positive, uh, we can go for the P62 stain, or if we have the antibody for the dipeptid repeats, and uh, if we have mutation data, obviously that helps, and we can call it C9 ALS. Uh, if, the if the inclusions are exclusively TDP4 positive, then ALS TDP. If uh, TDP4 is negative, then we can go for the other options. And uh, either ALS SOD or ALS FUS is the diagnosis. And then we always have to characterize the comorbidities which come with this disease. And uh, this is not going to go through. I'm not going to go through in details. But um, actually, we designed in this book a... Uh, uh, stepwise approach for block taking because as you see huge number of blocks are, are, are needed for a proper diagnosis of these cases and uh, you know either you do something properly or uh, or um, it is questionable what the worst of the whole exercise is and uh, earlier days all these things have been done in one go but uh, we propose sort of a stepwise approach because uh, depending on the labeling uh, patterns uh, you can decide whether you need the second or the step uh, the third step to characterize the disease, which looks so simple here. But actually, if we go back, it needs more than 100 slides for each and every case to uh, diagnose it properly. And I think I have to finish. So the FTLD talk is going to be <laughs> when you invite me next time, because I just run out of time. So this was, the, uh, this was the ALS part of my talk. I thought it would be a little bit longer, but I was a little bit too chatty. So, but uh, excuse me, but we at least covered the ALS more or less uh, completely. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>